Well, <coughs> welcome everybody. Our next speaker is the wonderful Babish Shrestha, and he is from Nepal, and he's currently based in Sydney, where he is a, a student at Western Sydney University. He is studying social work there. Babish is an amazing social activist, and he's also a TV presenter. He has a weekly talk show with Everest TV, where he's interviewing lots of amazing Nepalese people who are wanting to make a positive impact there. And he's particularly keen on empowering the Nepalese youth that are based in Australia so that they can grow as people, as change makers within their own right, uh, and to be able to give back in Nepal and in, the, in that community. I met, I met Babish in Nepal nearly three years ago, and I was incredibly impressed with this young man here. And it's been amazing to watch his journey over the last three years to where he is now. So I'm delighted to be able to welcome Babish here today, and I hope that he can share his story with you. Hi, Babish. Hello, Cathy. Thank you very much for having me. First and foremost, I'd like to thank you and especially thank you because this is such a wonderful platform to share my experience and thoughts regarding a particular topic especially which is connected to the youths and the teachers in the contemporary society as we are going through this uncertainty everybody is like panic and everything is not in a balance so we are trying our best building our resilience and our Thank you very much for uh, having this wonderful event which aims to empower the youths and motivate the teachers to do something positive, to make a something positive difference in the society. Thank you, Kathy. You're very welcome. It's great to have you here. Now, I know that the sound quality is not great today, but we will work with that. So please, uh, people that are listening, Please work very hard to understand exactly what Babish has got to say because he has an amazing story. Um, Babish, what are the challenges that you see in the current education system? So when it comes to the current education, majority of the students have to rely on the theoretical part rather than the practical. It's like the education system and the curriculum that has been drafted and created by the teachers, uh, by the people who are on the play on the board, it is the degree doesn't provide us the thing which is crucial, which is vital for the day-to-day -day life activities. But However, there are many changes. There, are, there have been many things. The vocational education training and practical education, which are really based to create a person job ready and to provide a particular set of skill set. It's really good. But the major challenges for students still are they have to rely on the books and they are far away apart from the natural world and they are not taught, they are just taught to do the thing, but it doesn't come into practice. That is the major challenge of the education system that I see and that I have been experienced since my early childhood. Though compared to the different countries' curriculum, in the developed countries, the curriculum have been made to experience and to do the, they are, drafted in such a way that enables the students to practice in the after graduating the high school or university but still in those countries we are underdeveloped uh, developing their curriculum seems to be like uh, quite um, impractical i see i would say because uh, they are mostly theoretical based and like it is like the students have to just read that thing and the end of the next day, the teachers come and they have to read all the thing. Or they have to remember all, all the books and go to the exams and write the same thing. And afterwards, when, I, when they advance to another class and they forget everything, what they have learned in the 
last year. So that is the major challenge. So what I believe is the education system, the curriculum should be created in such a way which is really helpful for the life skill of the person because education should be the as education is considered the backbone of the human beings, it should work in such a way which is helpful for the an individual's whole lifetime, not a particular time frame, I must say. Mm -hmm. Yes, and you're talking from your experience in Nepal, but you have also had many experiences with people from other countries. I know when I met you, we were meeting with more than 200 young people from 17 different countries, and many of them, most of them, had exactly the same stories about going to school and the education system being just the the curriculum just the content and it was totally separate from people's everyday life wasn't it so it, it's not just in your experience but it's in the experience of so many other people that you have met and Babish I'm hearing the same stories in New Zealand from many of the young people here that again it is learning for exams instead of learning for life so it's not just developed countries, developing countries. This is a common problem around the world now. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's really a sad thing to hear that. It's still one of the major problems for the students to learn the same thing in a year and just write it down in a paper when it, the exam date is scheduled. And afterwards, when he upgrades to the next class, then he have to go through whole new, completely a new set of curriculum, and it doesn't have the learnings of the past year, as it was like just for a few moments. It wasn't for a long time. So, I've, I've, yeah. actu I've actually talked to teachers in, in different countries around the world, particularly in Bangladesh, and they talk about that. They talk about the students starting again the following year, and they have forgotten everything that they have learned because that was last year, that was those exams, and I don't need it anymore. So, Babish, if you are thinking, what do you wish you had learned at school? So, yes, um, as we have already discussed about the challenges, as it is just like a short-term education, short-term mm -hmm. knowledge that we have been provided by the curriculum structure, curriculum framework from our studies our education system. I wish I could do, I could practice the thing that I have learned in my curriculum is it doesn't apply to all subjects though. Though I would like to share my experience is I had to study science in my till class 10, grade 10. But honestly, I haven't been given any chance to go to the science lab as it was because of the lack of resources as well. I wasn't able to go to the science lab and do the practical of those things which were mentioned in my books. And that was the major challenges as we just had to read how does the chemical compounds and everything goes well. How does the experiment happen? But we are not able to experience the experiment. So it is really uh, like a worrying problem, a worrying scenario for most of the students like me across the globe, I believe. Yes, I, I really understand that because I too have had that experience when I was living in Japan as a student and we had one lesson all year in the lab only one lesson in an entire and, talk. And one more thing I would like to add, Kathy. Sorry for the disruption. Yeah. Like, I have studied computer science as well in my um, school. But one of the fascinating facts is that I haven't even got a single chance to visit the computer lab till my grade eight. And it's, it's, re it's really like... Sounds funny, but it's real. It's real. 
And this is the situation, you know, uh, how our schools and universities, let's say our education system is preparing the students for the future. It says, it is said that, yes, education is preparing for the time when we graduate from our high school or university, when we indulge ourselves in the real world. But what if the curriculum doesn't enable us to do the thing or just it doesn't give the proper knowledge and the practice to do the same things in the real world? We are just we have we just know the formula, we just know the how to do it, but we have literally no idea how we have to make it happen. So I see this is the major problem, which is still prevalent in every country in across the globe. Especially in those developing countries where you haven't got the resources, or many of those countries' schools haven't got the resources, like enough computers, um, enough books, even in some in some places. So the countries where we do have access to science labs or computer labs, it makes a huge difference, doesn't it? Yeah, and one more thing, as you have already added, like the enough books is an, another problem. And I'd like to talk about my home country, Nepal. Uh, still, the situation is the same. Many people won't believe that. In the far western region of Nepal, especially in Pumla, Dolpa, in those areas, still the children are obliged to purchase, or let's say to get the books in the end of their term, like the education, like their year, when a student passed to class nine, the annual year, annual academic year starts from, uh, let's say, April, April, but they got the chance, they get the chance to read books and to have their own books after seven and eight months. They are obliged to rely on their teacher. They just have a single book. They read just a single book with the teacher, but rest of the classrooms are obliged to have just a pen, pencil, or the copy. And they have to rely whole on the teacher and whatever he teaches in the classroom. And according to that, they have to prepare themselves for the exam. So this, this is there is only there is only one book in the yeah, there class. is only one book in the and whole that, classroom and that is head by the teacher yeah that is head by the teacher and so the teacher uses the content of that book to teach the, all of the students and then the students need to learn from that absolutely and this situation and is still it is is still the same situation in the far western and underdeveloped uh, districts of Nepal. And it's quite, quite something, isn't it? It's really, it's really a uh, um, worrying situation for everyone. And they have to rely on the teacher and they have to prepare themselves for the exam and all. And even there are not much exams, I guess, because of the lack of the books and all the resources. And yeah, this is one of the pathetic plight, I must say, of the far western and those regions which are still underdeveloped and let's say which are where still the children have to wait for seven and eight months after their annual academic year to get their books in the government schools and there are not enough private schools as well and i think one of the another challenges of education system is the privatization of education educational system as well like the public schools and the private schools especially in the uh, underdeveloped countries, uh, let's say developing countries like Nepal, as I have experienced that, like you will find a huge difference between private and public schools. In the public schools, it is not well managed. It is lack of facilities and resources. Even the teachers do not arrive in time as the school starts at 10, some teachers, even even the principal, uh, goes to the school at like twelve or one. At some situation, though it's getting better day by day, but the situation hasn't been completely changed yet. 
so this is really worrying situation but in the private uh, in the private uh, private school what happens is everybody are supposed to be there and time every teachers are supposed to deliver the content accurately as they were uh, taught or they were uh, trained and uh, most of the people had to choose the private schools rather than the public as many in this the society has been shaped like if your children goes to the private school then the society would like the people will think like you belong to a medium class family or high class family an affluent family but if your children goes to the public school then there is a thinking there is a people have the mindset that <clears throat> they are poor we're talking there about the the expectations that people have that if you send your children to the public school then you are seen as being poor if yeah. you send your children to a private school then you are seen as being affluent absolutely yeah. that is still this situation of in like in my country in nepal still even the teachers who teaches in the government schools they send their children in the private schools then what does it means you know like they do not believe themselves that they can deliver the quality content in the public schools it clearly shows that and the government and the uh, leaders have been trying to make their policies that every teachers every government teachers are obliged to send their children in public schools but the rules and regulation hasn't been implemented yet so there's another big problem okay so let's talk about something that you're really really passionate about and that is you do a lot of work with youth and you really want them to be physically and mentally sound so what is crucial to enable that what is crucial for today's young people to be physically and mentally sound so when it comes to the youth like as we consider the youth as our present and the future as they are the one who leads the society the community and the country so it is paramount to the youths to be physically and mentally sound so for that especially as many people have been practicing nowadays the yoga and meditation and a healthy lifestyle as well it consists of the balanced diet and uh, everything as if you wish to do something different in your life or if you wish to make a positive difference in the society then or if you wish to make any change in anybody's life then at first you need to change yourself so for changing yourself you need to be physically and mentally active you need to be the admiring and inspirational figure for everyone so they can learn something positive or something good from you so for that purpose you need to be uh, physically and mentally sound and how to be how to balance our physically and mental life like mental health is uh, really a vital uh, thing that we have been talking of like many youths are suffering from different uh, mental issues like depression frustration and all and uh, as one of the another challenges is that there are many youths are not even many people are not able to deliver able they are not able to express when they suffer from mental health issues as there are many stigma and stereotype that has been attached with the mental health or even the the physical health as well mm -hmm. so for that purpose that's one of the things that is changing a little bit here babish is that um mental health has had a huge stigma but they are they are trying to reduce that stigma by enabling people to talk about it by encouraging people that when they are feeling um depressed etc that they reach out to somebody and i don't know whether you realize that new zealand has the highest rate of youth suicide in the world uh, i'm so sorry to i'm so sad to hear that 
as uh, I will, yeah, as we are discussing about the mental health issues, I believe the suicidal rate upsurges, or the suicidal rate, especially in the white youth society, committing suicide in such a young age, and one of the major reasons is the mental health issues as they cannot express their feelings, as they are not able to keep themselves mentally and physically sound. It is all because of the, uh, let's say, stereotype that has been attached with the mental health issues and all, as uh, we are used to believing uh, the society doesn't accept the mental health issue. They are afraid that they won't be able to be involved in any sector of the society if they share their problems with others. So it's really crucial. And um, what I see as the solution of maintaining the physically and mental health sound, as I have already mentioned as well, that a healthy lifestyle, what you do when you work, after you work up till the time when you go to the bed, what you do between the interval of the time. As many youths are being fascinated towards the yoga and meditation and I can, I'm really happy to share with you that uh, there are many youths in my country and especially in here in Australia as well, I've seen that they have been practicing the yoga and meditation in their regular day-to-day life activities and which is really beautiful thing, as it enables everyone to have a positive mindset, a clear vision, a clear mission and goal as um, it allows everyone to have a long-term goal or let's say it will show a positive pathway to everyone, you know. If you are physically and mentally sound, then you can do anything you wish to and you can set a goal with what you have been longing for since your childhood. So I believe practicing yoga and meditation in a regular basis will definitely allow not only the youth, but every age group of people to balance their life, to have or uh, to achieve their set of, different set of goals and uh, to make a positive difference and send in the community definitely as if they are healthy or if they are doing something positive change, then they will definitely spread the word. They will definitely um, share with their friends and families, which will allow them to get involved in the different uh, community changing programs and developmental programs, which will lead us to a better future, which will lead us to the prosperity, mm -hmm. I believe. Yes, you, in, in New Zealand, there's, there are some people doing doing meditation and, and yoga, but there is a much wider spread of people that are starting to do mindfulness to be able to, to take that time each day to calm themselves and to be able to be very mindful about what they're doing. And I think that that is making a big difference for people. Part of what you talked about within that was, and what we talked about the other day as well, was you see that it's very important for young people to have a mission and a vision for what they're wanting to achieve in the next five years, to have a purpose that they care about so that they can focus on that as well. Is that something that you think is important? Absolutely. I do think it's really, really important, especially for the youth. As many, even I want to I want to share an example with you as well an experience that I have been experiencing in different moments. Like many of my friends come to me and say that they want to do something different. They want to make, uh, they want to achieve uh, their set of goals. But when I ask them, where do you see yourself in the next five years? They will, the answer will probably be the location. I will be in this country or I will be in another country. And when I ask them what you will be doing in that country, which profession you will be involved in that time frame, then they are clueless. They have no idea. And they feel like, oh, I haven't ever ever thought of this. What will be I doing after five years? And this is, I say, 
a million dollar question but where, where do you see yourself in next five years because this is the question and if you are able to find the answer then it means that you have a clear mission vision and goal that you will be doing these things so you will be achieving a particular uh, set of goals in the next five years so if somebody says that i want to do something in my life i want to make my life productive i want to make my time fruitful then they should definitely have a mission vision and goal especially youths and the youngest people as they have plenty of time they will have the enthusiasm energy and the gut and the grit to do a lot of positive things in the society so if they have a better plan then they can easily track their pathway to their uh, goals and ideas and i think you you and your own life are a really clear example of that and i don't know when your um deep seated desire to help empower young people i don't know when that started but what i've seen in you over time is that you have had this goal you've you've had this desire to help young people um grow and become leaders in their own right so that is that has been a clear goal for you and you've you've gone to australia you've had a clear goal of going to australia or to going overseas to study social work so that you can um, be more empowered to make a difference for people how did you find your goal so uh, thank you very much for your beautiful words <laughs> as first and uh, i remember the first day when i have been to one of our community child clubs and um, at that day that is the day when i started my social activism journey and um, i was really inspired by the children of my same age doing really great things doing conducting different programs and i found my uh, let's say passion and interest that social activism it's something that i have been willing to do my since my childhood i was really fascinated to be a social worker especially my dad is one of the inspiring figures for me as he was uh was the let's say a social worker and a politician as well and he always used to say me that we should always give more than we take as the world is about give and take though we should always be mindful about that we should be giving more than we take as it will allow everyone to make a positive difference in the society but if you think that you should take more and give less then that is not how the things work so afterwards i figured out that i should continue my social journey and i have been involved in different social organizations youth organizations and i got the chance to participate in different programs conducted by various social organizations and what i started feeling like okay now i have a clear set of mission that i'm going to be a social worker or a change maker i will be one of the change makers the changing or uh, let's say creating a positive impact in my society and afterwards i thought okay i have already decided to be a change maker i have already decided to be a social maker then what's next what should i do to be a good person a good citizen of my country at first because if i want to change my country then i have to change myself at first as i have already mentioned it so i started to change my day to day activities i started to research about it i started to uh, research about different social organization different programs that i can participate in develop my professional uh, let's say where i can grow personally and professionally so for my professional growth and personal growth i did everything that i can 
participate in every seminars, programs, and trainings and all. And I developed myself and I started providing different trainings, be it on child rights, child activism, ending the child marriage, which is one of the uh, disastrous problems across the globe. Uh, and be it in the sustainable development goals, which is supposed to be achieved by 2030, which is set by the United Nations and all. So afterwards, uh, I figured out the things which is necessary to be a social worker, and I'm still on the journey, on the same journey, and I'm still doing my best to develop myself and do something good in my society. So your father was an amazing role model at the beginning because he was he was encouraging you and a real inspiration for you. And then you got inspiration from the other people around who were also making a difference. And as you've done more, you have gained more, grown more, got more inspired to keep going, haven't you? Definitely, Cathy, yes. My father and the same people and the people of my age who is still my role model and inspirational figure for me, which motivates and encourages me to continue the pathway that I had been here for a long time. And so looking for those role models also helps to give you inspiration, which, which gives you that motivation. I know one thing that we were talking about recently was around motivation. And you have lots of young people coming to you and saying, how do you stay motivated? And, you know, I watch a motivational video or something on YouTube. And then I come off the video and I'm feeling great. But in 30 minutes time, I'm back to I'm back to how I was. So how do we stay motivated? What's your answers for that question? So it is one of the wonderful questions, I believe. <laughs> it is a million dollar question as well. As yeah, it's a common problem of everyone that if you want to stay motivated, then of course, definitely, we have the access to the internet and YouTube, and we just type motivational videos and lots of videos come across us and we watch it and we feel so powerful that we can even change the globe within a few days, a couple of days, but afterwards when the when we just finish the video and after an hour or half an hour, we again start feeling the same that, okay, I don't think like I can do this. It's not my cup of tea and everybody feels like that. But when it comes to staying motivated every time, it's like what I say is like if you take a shower or a bath just a single day, then you can't keep yourself clean every day. Like if you take a shower today, then you must have to take a shower tomorrow as well or every day. You are supposed to do that to maintain the personal hygiene. Well, how you can say that just watching a single motivational video in a, in a particular day can motivate or you will stay motivated for your whole life. So you should feed the positive content every day. You should read or you should watch the positive things. You should start your day with the positive things, with the self auto suggestion or positive affirmations. When you wake, wake up, just uh, advise yourself that yes, today is going to be a beautiful day. Yes, I'm going to make this day a productive day. I will be happy. I'll be more calm. I'll be more friendly with my friend. I'll, be, I'll never be angry with anyone. I will try to help as much as I can. I will make a positive difference. And that self auto suggestion, which you feed yourself at the same time when you wake up, then it's really powerful that goes on your subconscious mind, which allows you to keep positive and motivated the whole day. But that is not limited to the self photo suggestion only, but you have to do, you have to watch and read the positive contents, like you have to read positive books, which is inspiring. Uh, you can read the biography of the inspirational figures, you know, uh, which really helps people to do, which really encourages people 
to stay motivated to do really better and to give their 100% in whatever they do so that i is, feel like yeah that is really really fantastic advice we talk a lot here in new zealand about people um you know starting their day off in a positive way a lot of people are talking about a gratitude journal which is a very similar thing isn't it you've got your actualizations which you're saying each each morning to set yourself up for a good day um, other people are spending time to write down three or four things every day that they are grateful for because it again sets your day up in a positive way the other thing that i'm i'm hearing from you as you're talking is that we can have these motivational videos, um, but for you, it's important that they are focused, that you bring the focus back into what your, what your key focus is, that we can take things from each of the motivational videos that we are watching, and then we bring it in how we can use it in our focus area. Is that right? Yes, definitely. So the every contents has their own significance and every videos are made in such a way to motivate everyone but at the end of the day you should know what you want to do you need to be clear in your mission vision and goal and likewise you need to be mindful that you need to do the particular things which is required to accomplish the set of goals accomplish your mission and vision and goal which matches with your uh, passion and interest. That is really crucial for everyone to be staying motivated or to give 100% whatever they do. So what I believe is many people say that do what you love, but it's not only, it doesn't only work like that. You should love what you do as well. So when you start loving what you do, then automatically everything you're going to see the positivity in everything. And you have already mentioned that gratitude and gratefulness is like uh, paramount to everyone. Everybody should be, when we start being gratitude, when we start being gratefulness to each and every small actions, then we will be showered with the joy, blessings, and the love of everyone. And we will see positivity in everything and we will never be we will never feel low we will never see the negative things we will be always motivated and inspired and that doesn't mean that we don't have hard times because that's one of the other things i know about you and your life is that you have been through some very 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 tough times and yet you are so positive um i know that like me your father has died and that that was a really hard time and still is in your life. You miss him dearly. And so we can be incredibly positive and focus on the positive, but it doesn't take away the hard times. It just gives us the strength to be able to go through them. Definitely, Kathy. So there is always pros and cons of everything, as we all are familiar with. There is always positive and negative aspects of everything. But why, what we need to emphasize is we need to focus on the positivity. But it, it doesn't mean that don't see the negative aspects. You need to look to the negative aspects and the ways to reduce the negativity in everything. But what we need to focus and emphasize is the positive ones. So we can deal with anything at any situation. That is a brilliant summary at the end. So thank you for that. What we focus on is what we'll grow more of. And so focusing on the positive will grow more of that positive and give us the strength to get through and also to be able to make a terrific impact. Babish, thank you so much for talking with us today. I've loved what you've, what you've shared here and thank you for sharing your journey as well and your thoughts. Not a problem. And I'd like to extend my heartful uh let's say thankful and gratefulness to you as well, Kathy. And it wouldn't be possible without you and without this wonderful event to share my experience and insights with everyone watching here. And uh, thanks a lot, um, Kathy. Uh, whatever you are doing is really great. And I would love to be a part of your upcoming events and upcoming 
John is as well. And it, I'm really, I can express in words how grateful I am for your generous support and help in every moment. You have been one of the role models and inspiring figures, to be honest, is still there. And the words and the way you have seen my experience, the way you have uh, been, and uh, uh, you have been analyzing my moments and my activity, and you have been sharing that you are doing a great. And it means a lot to me, and it encourages me a lot to do all the things, whatever I'm doing. And whenever I feel like, okay, I'm feeling quite low, then again, I feel, I feel high, and I feel very good, and my heart is really full of blissfulness, and I'm, blessed. I'm really blessed and blissful to have you in my life as well as a mentor, as a teacher, as a friend, I would say. Yeah, no, thank you very, very much. And I know that you do exactly the same for the people that are around you, that you provide that same encouragement. So thank you. Keep doing what you're doing. Um, I'm looking forward to seeing you, to seeing where it takes you in the future. And uh, I wish yes, you all... Thank you very much for your beautiful words, Kathy. Thanks a lot for having me here. Thank you very much.